Um, well, it's, it's here. Whether we like it or not, Christmas is here. Um, it's everywhere we look now when you're driving around. So like in our house, um, I have a child who has so much Christmas spirit, you just can't even contain her. Um, and so she wanted to decorate our house right after Halloween. And so we've had our stuff up for a few weeks now. And you know what? I'm right there with her. I love it. So we've just been enjoying our decorations and watching Christmas movies. And, and I feel like we have already watched all the Christmas movies we could watch. So if you have any recommendations for me, that would be great. I know. I know. And she's just, she's praying for snow. She just really, really wants some snow. Um, okay, so we are here, we're in the season of Advent now, and uh, the kids are going to be leading us through the Advent calendar as we approach Christmas Eve. It's going to be wonderful, talking us through hope and peace and joy and love, looking at the, the meaning of Advent. And so this word Advent in the Latin is Adventus, and it means coming or arrival, And we have a word in the Greek that holds that same meaning um, that we see in the New Testament. It's the word parousia. This word means coming to be present, sort of the Greek form of Advent. And we hear Paul use this word parousia often when he's writing to the church and he's talking about coming to visit them, coming to be with them. He uses this word parousia. And as we work through um, the New Testament, often this word parousia is spoken of Jesus and his, his second coming. And so, you know, Advent, as Aaron mentioned this morning, uh, reminds us of this waiting that we exist in, this waiting period that we're all in as we wait for the second coming of Christ, as we wait for the parousia of the King of heaven and earth. Now in the Gospels, during Jesus' ministry, he speaks of his own parousia, of his own um, second coming. In Matthew 24, he says to his disciples, As lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And he goes on to to give these signs that will happen. And he says, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. So here there will be this day when Jesus will come in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, where Every eye will see and every knee will will bow. Everybody will see him for who he is. And we will see him face to face. And he will gather his elect. He will gather all of his followers, both those who have gone before us, who have died in Christ, and those who are still living will be gathered to him when he returns. In the book of Revelation at the very end, Jesus ends the book by saying, yes, I am coming soon, promising his church of his arrival, of his advent. And when he returns, this is not us being uh, taken up into heaven and floating off somewhere in the clouds, somewhere in the sky. When Christ returns, he is coming to this earth to be with humanity. In Habakkuk 2.14, the Amplified Version says, The time is coming when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The time is coming when the earth will be filled with the glory of God, with the knowledge of who he is. Nothing left untouched, just everything completely saturated with heaven, with the presence of God, with, with the glory of God. And so when Jesus comes... He is actually bringing heaven to earth. And there will be this unification between the heavens and the earth. And we see through the the scriptures this sort of visual of this new heavenly Jerusalem just descending upon the earth and God's rule and reign just filling creation. God will be all in all. And we will see him as he truly is. We will know him even as we are fully known by him now. This is complete renewal, complete 
restoration. And we have sort of this imagery in the scriptures so that we can kind of imagine what this might look like. In Isaiah 65, God says, pay close attention now. I'm creating a new heavens and a new earth. All the earlier troubles, chaos, and pain are the things of the past to be forgotten. Look ahead with joy. Anticipate what I am creating. Look ahead with joy. Anticipate. Be expectant for what I'm going to create on the earth. John has this same sort of language in the book of Revelation. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them. He will wipe every tear and there'll be no more death or sorrow, crying or pain. The old order will pass away. And the one sitting on the throne, Jesus, the king of heaven and earth says, look, I am making everything new. Not look, come up here with me. He says, look, like, yes, I am coming soon and I will make all things new. And we're told that the lion and the lamb will lie down together. There will be this complete peace and, and harmony Everywhere we look, that will be our experience. And not only will the earth be completely transformed and renewed, but also our mortal bodies will be completely transformed. We're not going to be these spirits with no bodies just kind of floating around. These bodies will be renewed. We'll be given new bodies. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians, this hope that we have and he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must close, clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Paul goes on to say, thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. These perishable bodies that are subject to aging and decay and pain and suffering, They will be transformed into this imperishable, immortal body, full of glory, full of life. So when Jesus returns after the resurrection and he's with his disciples, he comes in flesh and blood. He says, look it, feel my hands, I'm flesh and bone. And he sits and he has a meal with them. But yet he can also walk through walls. It's like this, this crazy, wild, immortal body that will be given. When Paul talks about all of the, the promises of God and who God is, he assures us, he says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. These are, these are promises that are a for sure thing. And so we say amen, this, this so be it. Because you have said it, Lord, so be it. Let it come. And this will be our great hope. That on the last day, on, on the last day of the last days that we are in, at the end of all things, we will have this joy and this peace and this love in, in all of its fullness. All things will, will be ours. All things will be fully realized and experienced, like just completely in the presence of God just newness at every, every corner. Let's just let our imaginations run wild for a second because we've been given these imaginations, right? Even though no eye has seen and no ear has heard what God has in store for those who love him, we have these imaginations and we have the scriptures. So just for a second, just let it run wild. What would that look like for you? What would that smell like? What would that taste like? What would it feel like? What will it be like to walk on the earth and there's no more death or decay. There's no more pain or sadness. There's no more poverty, no more suffering, no more evil or injustice, no more men vying for power and control, trying to take over the world and killing innocent people. No more wars. What will that be like? 
can hardly describe it. And it will be more than we ask. It will be more than we imagine. When Jesus returns, he will set all things right and all longings will be satisfied. All disappointments will fade away. Our bodies will, will be renewed. And you could you kind of feel it in your bones, this longing for that, right? We have this inward wrestle with this uh, life that we're in now where we experience brokenness and pain because we know this is not the way it should be because God has put eternity in our hearts and so we experience all this brokenness and we're like, no, Lord, this is not how it should be and we, and we wrestle and Paul describes this wrestling in 2 Corinthians. He says, We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and we are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Now there's, there's a lot there. What Paul is saying here is inwardly we groan and, and we lament and we grieve because we know what God has purposed us for, what he has destined us for is eternity and new creation and life actually to be swallowed up, to be fully consumed with his life. To have flourishing and, and abundance. And so one day when Christ returns at the parousia, we'll experience victory. Amen? This is our hope. And so Peter talks about this hope. I love the voice translation. He says, Blessed is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, because he has raised Jesus, the Anointed One, from death. Through his great mercy, we have been reborn into a living hope. Like we've been born into life. We've, Christ is our living hope, so we are born anew in him. And it says we've been reborn for an eternal inheritance held in reserve in heaven that will never fade or fail through faith, God's power is standing watch, protecting you for a salvation that you will see completely at the end of things. You should greatly rejoice in what is waiting for you, even if now for a little while you have to suffer various trials. Look to the future, as Aaron was saying, the salvation held out for us, waiting for Christ's return. There's this Greek word that we come across in the New Testament just a couple times, and it's maranatha. I'm sure you've heard this word before. It means, oh, Lord, come. And the early church, the early Christians would, when they would come together, they would meditate on this word, and they would say it slowly, maranatha. Oh, Lord, come. As the book of Revelation ends, it says, the spirit and the bride say, Come. The church cries out, Maranatha. We long for this. We long for his return. We long to be clothed with immortality, to be swallowed up with life, and for all suffering to end. And so this is the gospel to the world, right? I know things are bad now, but just wait. Because the day is coming. Here's the good news. Keep waiting. Things will get better when you die. Just hold out. Keep waiting. Because when Jesus returns, then you'll experience heaven on earth. When Jesus comes one day, just keep waiting. One day God will be here. One day his kingdom will come. One day we'll experience his life. Just wait it out. And so we keep praying, Maranatha. And we wait. And we 
you just wait. I'm getting good at waiting. Because the scriptures are full of waiting. When brokenness enters into the world, humanity waits a lot. Abraham and Sarah wait for a child. Israel waits in oppression in Egypt, waiting to be rescued for 400 years. Again, we follow Israel and they wait and they wander through the desert and the wilderness. They wait for the promised land. And again, they wait in exile because of their corruption and injustice and evil. They are sent in to exile, ruled over by a violent nation, and they wait. They wait for God to come. They wait for God to bring his kingdom. And for hundreds of more years after that, they wait and they wait as they're ruled over by foreign nations and corrupt kings. And they just keep on waiting, waiting on the promise. Because through the prophets, God had promised Israel, one day, one day, my kingdom will come to you. One day you will experience heaven on earth. One day I'm going to send to you a savior. One day the Messiah will come and he will liberate Israel and you will have victory over your enemies. You will have freedom. And so they waited for the advent of this promised Messiah of their Jewish king. And then we know how the story goes. This is not a surprise to us, right? I'm not like leaving you in suspense here. You know one day the waiting is over when we get to the Gospels. And so we get to Luke and this young woman who is yet to be married and is a virgin, this angel comes to her and says, you will conceive a son and it won't be by the help of any man. The Holy Spirit is going to come to you and place um, this child in your womb. And he is the promise. He is the long-awaited Messiah, Mary, and you are going to house him. And the angel says, you will call him Jesus, and he will be great. He'll be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So Mary's like, oh my gosh. The promise, it's here. God is faithful. And for me will come the hope of an entire nation. Hundreds and hundreds of years of waiting. Mary's like, this, this long-awaited promise will come from me. And then we get to Luke 2, and, and Jesus has been born, and we meet this man named Simeon. And it says in Luke 2.25, There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout. He was waiting. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. One day, Jesus comes in his presence, and it says, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Here, Simeon was waiting, but he was waiting with expectancy. He knew that God was faithful. God told him, you will see the promise in your lifetime. And so he waited, and then one day walks in the Messiah, and he holds the hope of a nation in his arms. He holds the long-awaited promise of God, and he praises God for it. Because he knows now the waiting is over and he can die because the Messiah has arrived onto the scene and he knows this is a big deal because with this Messiah, with this king, comes the kingdom of God and Israel will have victory. They will have freedom. And as we follow the life of Jesus through the Gospels, we find out that this Messiah is more than Israel hoped for more than they dared to dream, more than they asked or imagined, more than they ever expected. Because not only was he sent from God, he was God himself. 
And not only was he the hope of one nation, he was the hope of all nations, the hope of all humanity. Simeon says he's a a light for revelation to the Gentiles and, and the glory of the people of Israel. And so John starts off his gospel with this fact that God came in the flesh to humanity. He says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, through him all things were made. Down in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. That God became flesh, he came to the earth in the midst of humanity's sort of suffering and pain and brokenness and darkness. He came to earth to dwell with this word tabernacle, to literally make his home with the people. Not to take them out of the world, but to be with them in the world, here and now. The waiting is over. This is the promise God said he would come, and he does come in and through Christ. And again, this is Jesus bringing heaven to earth. His gospel is the kingdom is here. His gospel is the kingdom is among us now, to be experienced now. We're not waiting around for it. It has arrived because the king has arrived, because God is here. This is the gospel that we preach. We're not just like, wait and wait some more one day. We're like, no, the kingdom is here. It's among us. It's, it's actually in us. This has always been what God has been promising. This has always been who God has revealed himself as to his people. In the Old Testament, even when we see all these stories of waiting, he comes to Abraham and Sarah and he gives them a child, the promise. We follow the story of Israel. He rescues them from slavery. He comes and he he takes them out of oppression and he dwells in the midst of them and makes them his people. And he leads them in the desert. As they wander through the desert, God does come through. He is faithful. He leads them into the promised land. And even when they turn from him, even when they turn towards evil and corruption and they reject and forsake the God who saved them, he still comes over and over and over again in the, New Te- in the Old Testament when his people call upon his name. He is the God who comes. He is the God who breaks through here and now in the midst of all the brokenness. God always comes. In Ephesians 1, Paul says, when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. See, there's promise fulfilled now The Holy Spirit, the the person of Jesus, the power and the presence of God, this is the promise that is actually ours today. And because of that, because the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee, we know that there is still a promise awaiting us when Christ returns. This word parousia, it actually has two meanings. It means coming to be present, but it also means present presence, presently present. It's the same with Maranatha. It means, oh, Lord, come, but it also means the Lord has come. And so as the early church meditates on this Maranatha, they are holding this tension. They're in between worlds, (laughs) But they're saying, oh, Lord, come in in our moaning and our groaning and our pain and our suffering. Oh, Lord, come. And we have this great hope in you. But they're also saying, oh, Lord, thank you that you are here. Thank you, Father, that you hear us, that you always hear us, that you always come. Thank you that your kingdom is at hand among us. And so Advent is the same. Advent is this looking forward to the future and what will be ours fully but it's also celebrating what is already ours. Jesus, who is our peace. Jesus, 
who is our joy, Jesus who is love, he is here now with us. And so during Advent, we remind ourselves that these things are to be experienced among us, among God's people. In Acts 1.11, Jesus has uh, resurrected, and he's come and he's shown himself to his disciples, and he's spent quite some time with them, and it's time for him to sort of leave the earth, and he does this crazy thing where he ascends up into the heavens until they can see him no more, right before their very eyes. And there's these angels there with him, and they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So I just wonder how long they were waiting. How long were they just looking up, saying, okay, any second now, it's going to come back. Maybe it was like an hour or two, I don't know. Just waiting and waiting. The angel's like, what are you doing? Why are you waiting around? He will come back. But Jesus has told you something. Jesus has a promise he wants to give you. Go and get it. So as we follow the book of Acts, we see that the promise comes, this long-awaited promise, the Holy Spirit comes and fills Jesus' followers. They're filled with his power. They're filled with his presence. This is who we are. People who are filled with the Spirit of God people who house the Messiah. And as we follow Acts, we see where the Jesus followers go, the kingdom goes as well, right? Because they are filled with the Holy Spirit. So everywhere they go, they're just bringing the glory of God. They're bringing this, this new creation. They're bringing the kingdom so when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. If you have believed upon him, you have the Spirit. This is who we are. We are people of the Spirit, people of the presence, people of the kingdom. And we are not waiting around looking up in the sky. We're not waiting. We are partaking. We are partnering with God we are partnering with Jesus' ministry to bring the kingdom to earth, to make God known, to fill the earth with the knowledge of God. So here, this is when we gather, when we are together, we're not waiting around for something. We're experiencing, we are meant to experience the kingdom among us. When we are together, we are meant to experience new creation, and we are also meant to bring God's kingdom to this world. Wherever we find ourselves, whatever sphere of influence we have, whether it's with our families or in the workplace, wherever it may be, we are, we are influencers. Like We are called to come into those places and bring the kingdom, to bring hope and peace and joy and love and all the other many things that come with it to be the evidence of new creation. We're not passively waiting around for this thing. Jesus says in Matthew 11, from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. So Jesus comes and he is filled with the Spirit on the day of his baptism. He knows who he is. He knows he is the son of his heavenly father. Like his identity is secure. He knows he has the power and the presence of God. And so he just advances the kingdom. Like everywhere he goes, he knows the kingdom is, is within him. And so everywhere he goes, he brings the kingdom. He's not just sitting around and he's showing people who God is through love and acceptance and, and kindness and signs and wonders and miracles. In 1 Timothy 6, Paul is speaking to the young pastor that he mentors, and he says to Timothy, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Like, does this sound like waiting around? Fight the good fight of faith. Like, go for it, Timothy. The kingdom is upon you. The spirit is within you. 
says take hold of it. Take hold of it. Don't just sit around waiting for it. Go for it. In John 14, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. He had to go to the Father so he could pour out his spirit on all flesh, on every tongue, tribe, every nation, so that people all over the earth would be filled with his spirit and be able to do the ministry that he did, to be able to do the works that he was doing to pray for the sick, to cast out demons, to heal and and to set free, to raise the dead. Can you imagine? We're called to raise the dead. Jesus did it. He said you'll do even greater things. And when he ascended, it says that he poured out these spiritual giftings upon his church, upon his body, and that we are filled with these giftings to expand the kingdom, Not for our own glory and fame, but to actually reach our hands out and and bring the kingdom to our brothers and our sisters, to our family and our friends, to our co-workers. We're called to serve. We're called called to give to the poor, to welcome in the, um, the homeless and take care of the widows and the orphans, to display who God is with our lives. And we can do this because of his power within now, let me just be real for a second, because I am a bit of a realist. And um, I know that we experience suffering and pain, and I know that many of us know what it means to be broken. Many of us know what it means to mourn and, and to grieve, to suffer loss. Those things are very real, and we're not ignoring those things, but we are saying, God is here in our midst, and he has come to be with us in that. And there is hope for today. Like, we know that the kingdom is here because who has experienced the kingdom of God in their lives? Who has experienced the presence of God, the love of God? Like, we have known this. We have seen it. We've experienced it for ourselves. I've been to South Africa where I saw blind eyes open and deaf ears that could hear and literally people who were mute could could talk and the lame could walk. And God is doing these things on the earth today through his followers. And I know we're not seeing it at every turn. I know we're not seeing it every time we pray, but we keep pressing in. And we keep going for it. And we keep believing because God has said it is so. If he has said, Your, my power is in you. If he has said, you'll do greater works than I, then we will keep going for those things. Even when it seems like it's not working. We will keep reaching out in faith. Because the kingdom is at hand. And the Holy Spirit is here right now. And we thank you, Lord, that you are here. And so we can have this expectation. Like we can actually expect God to do great things among us and through us here today. And so some of you might say, you know, Megan, you contradict yourself because, you know, you're just saying a few weeks ago, you know, faith is rest. And, you know, you're talking about trust in God and, and, and be still and know. So which is it? Well, those things are true, right? But rest and trust does not mean inaction. And it does not mean idleness. It does not mean giving up. Because James tells us that faith is proved by its actions, not by waiting around. And so we rest in God's power, not by might, nor by strength, but by the Spirit. That's where we find our rest, because it's God's promises. Like, I'm not standing here today guaranteeing you something from my own sort of words or will. Like, this, I can say these things because God says these things. And so the church is called to be a signpost. Like, this may sound kind of sci-fi, but like, you are from the future, We are people of the future. We are people who house the living hope of new creation. 
And so with our lives and, and in the midst of us, like we are the evidence of God and his kingdom here and now so that when people interact with us, when people interact with the church and Jesus' followers, like, oh, that's what God is like. Oh, that's the kingdom. Like we are these little, these microcosms all over the earth displaying who God is, displaying his power, bringing people into his presence. We are people of the future. And yes, we do exist in the not yet. We do. And stuff happens and we, we suffer. But even in that, we hold on to this hope. This hope for the return of Jesus. So here's the proverb for today. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. The message says, unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. But a sudden good break can turn life around. The kingdom is full of sudden good breaks. So yeah, we're waiting. But God does not leave us heart sick. He says, I'm here. He is our our tree of life. He is our breakthrough. Paul says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are very bold in our prayers. We are going after this thing. We are believing for it. See, I would rather not err on the side of caution To err on the side of caution is the just in case. Let's buy an extra pack of hot dogs just in case more people come. Let's let's just hold off on that for a bit just in case it doesn't happen. Let's not risk it. Let's not even try it because it might not work out. I would rather not err on the side of caution. I would rather press in to the here and the now. I would rather press into the promises. I would rather press into the Holy Spirit and his power and in that experience the not yet than just stay in the not yet. I'd rather press in to what is possible. Like at the end of my life, I don't want to say, oh, You could have done that. I didn't think you would, so I didn't even try. Like, I want to press in and, and, and press into God. says, I can do more than you ask or imagine. I want to believe for that kind of stuff. I want to believe that one day I will raise a dead person. (laughs) Don't you want to do that? So I guess what I'm saying, (laughs) I guess what I'm saying is let's hold on to our hope and let's praise and glorify Jesus, our Savior, because of the great hope held out for us. Because eternity awaits us. But let's also believe that we are these eternal, like we're meant to experience eternity now. Eternal life is knowing Christ Let's believe that God says my kingdom is among you and let's just keep going for it. Let's just keep attempting. We're just going to keep attempting. We're just going to keep trying. Not being afraid of failure. Like, I know I prayed for you last time and I know, you know, we didn't, nothing happened, but let's try again. Or, I don't think I'm going to pray for that person because I'm not sure God would do it. (laughs) Let's just see. Let's just live on the adventurous side. Michael had a word last um, Saturday night at the worship evening. And I don't, do we have a mic? Uh, I don't have a mic. Maybe we could just grab him one. Um, He shared it. It was really powerful. And um, I wanted him to share it again because 
not all of us were there, and also we could just use an extra dose of prophecy this morning. No? Mike? Maybe you could just hop on one of these on your mic there. Just wait. Just wait. It's coming. Teach your voice. Yeah? Okay, teach your voice until, sure. Teach, teach your voice, please? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, during, during the worship time, there was just this building of intimacy and urgency. Um, if I can go, just go back to they that wait on the Lord to renew their strength, um, that word wait means to kind of want to use this example of um, there are times when Trudy and I will just be on our couch and just all tangled up like hugging each other but we don't say any words right it's like words almost wreck that um, that intimacy and that and there's something in those moments when we're all tangled up and just together it's like it's like, you know when your battery is at 5% and it's like, okay, this will not last all day. But when, when, you, when you've plugged it in all night and you pick it out in the morning and it's 100%, you're all day. And it's this tangling up with God. It's like it gets us to 100%. And it's, and, but anyway, so it was this urgency and imminency that I felt that God's on the move. And sometimes we have a tendency to look, like, I, I'm not criticizing anything or anyone, but it's like we were singing older songs, and people were kind of like reminiscing good times in the past. And sometimes you can get locked because you're in disappointment and you're in a desert time. You can kind of go, oh, I need satisfaction, so I'm going to look back. Hmm. And, and I just felt, God, go, I, I just felt this urgency. It's like, okay, guys, look forward now. And I said, at that night, I talked about, I had this dream a while ago. And uh, in the dream, I was in the Chilliwack River, and I was just sort of like floating, but I wasn't being carried downstream. And I was right by the Vedder Bridge. And as I was just kind of floating there, all of a sudden, this wave began to grow, and I was being lifted up on top of this wave. And the wave wasn't moving. And it grew and grew until it was, like, higher than this building. And I was on top of this wave at the river. And then all of a sudden, I felt the wave begin to move. And I was moving with the wave. And then I woke up. And it, it was this sense of, it was this sense of God is beginning to move. And it is something new, and it is something wild. And it was like that verse, it was like, you know, the kingdom of God is advancing passionately, and passionate people take hold of it. And it was this idea of, it was this sense that God has, he sees our disappointment. He sees the dryness. He sees the hurt. He, he sees the woundedness. He knows, he knows your suffering. And it's like he's holding out his hand and he's going, come wait with me. Come entangle yourself with me. But we're going on a ride. We're going on a wild ride. And those dreams that he's put in you, those longings that he's put in you, doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter kind of what vintage you are. God's go going, I put them there for a purpose actually to be fulfilled on this earth. And I just feel like it is a, it's, he's going like, it's time. Uh, get ready for a wild ride. Amen. Awesome. Yeah, you just get the words. That's great. So we are going to believe on that, and, and um, we're going to ask for that. We're going to press into that. And, you know, we're doing the Christmas parade. We're opening up our building to our city on Saturday. So, like, maybe we could just, the kingdom could just encounter some people that day. And maybe when you go to work tomorrow, you know, Someone needs a, a taste of new creation. Someone in your family or one of your friends. So this is what we're going to do. 
Um, if you need to go, you can go. You can get your kids. Uh, we have gone um, quite a bit over time today. <laughs> but we are always going to be here. Yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to be here for prayer. Um, we're going to have a bunch of people come up for prayer ministry. And we're going to just check in to see.